Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our speaker series. So real quick, I'm um, just going to do just some brief housekeeping. Uh, so in order for you to get credit for your attendance, two things. Fill out the survey. The survey you will find on the wall, QR code reader. If you have an iPhone, just put it up to the QR reader, and the survey will pop up. Um, or you can type in the tiny URL. So fill out the survey, it asks for you know which class, it asks about, you know, you get to rate the speaker, you get to rate the food, um, and we want to know, you know, what you guys think about the new setup. And then to confirm your attendance at the end, we're gonna have two scanners, uh, one on this table, one on that table. So if you have your student body card. We scan your student body card. Now, if you don't have a student body card, we happen to have a student body card maker here on my left. So I highly encourage you to get a student body card because there's some discounts, from my understanding, that I have 50% off on bus tokens. Um, I know the little coffee shop, you get like a hot dog or a hamburger and a cup of coffee and chips for like $3 after five or something like that. So there's some benefits to having a student body card. Now, to introduce our speaker this evening, we have Jay and Kara. All right. Hello, everyone. Oh, it's loud. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jay, and I use he, him pronouns. And my name is Carol, and I use she, her pronouns. And we are the co-presidents of GSA, which is the Gender Sexuality Alliance uh, Club here on campus. Our mission is to create a safe and welcoming campus for the LGBTQ plus community. Um, it's a, an allies, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we socialize, we meet, and we just talk about um, any uh, issues going on. Uh, we just want to learn. It's a place you can learn and respect. Like other people, um, so <laughs> you receive support. Um, in addition to our regular meetings, we plan to partner with other organizations, including the Black Student Union. Uh, we <laughs> shout out to Stacy. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna bring some exciting new events like Quality Day or Pride Day. So expect that coming up uh, soon this semester. Um, we also plan to bring a speaker or two on campus. Our meetings for GSA are Tuesdays from 3 to 4 in the clubhouse here in the Grove. Um, if you don't know where that is, it's building 5, so it's like the third floor of this building. Um, yeah, feel free to drop in whenever you want. We would like to get to know more about GSA. We're always here and we're, we're happy to see new faces. Are there any GSA members? Are there any current GSA members? Okay, shout out to uh, the Brain yeah. Club. <laughs> We meet Tuesdays from 3 to 4 in the clubhouse. That's in the Student Life Center where you get your ID card. Yeah. And now, <laughs> so we are totally psyched to be introducing tonight Dr. Danny Mahoney. And Danny, Dr. B, I should say, Dr. B is a supporter of GSA and is an out and visible queer faculty member here at Kenyatta College. Um, her haircut is totally on purpose, we found out yesterday. <laughs> Other than her rad haircut, here are some awesome things about Dr. B. She was born and raised in the glorious state of New Jersey. She is a total science nerd and a band nerd. She identifies most um, in her spirit as a tuba player. Um, she has a BS in biology, Bachelor of Science in biology from Boston College where she worked as a research assistant um, at Boston Children's Hospital and studied prostate cancer. She has a PhD in biomedical science with a focus on the role of extracellular matrix in bone development and repair from the University of California, San Francisco. <clears throat> she taught general biology, human physiology, microscopy, and good laboratory practices at Merritt College 
and for the UC Berkeley Extension Program. She has worked for the LGBT community as a communications coordinator for the UCSF Center of Gender Equity and program coordinator for the UCSF LGBT Resource Center. She has been a faculty member at Kenyatta College since 2009, where she spends half her time teaching pre-allied health students how the human body works and how to talk to their future healthcare patients and the other half teaching non-science majors how the human body works and how to talk to their healthcare providers. Dr. Bean is a strong advocate for women in science and for LGBT students. She is the funniest and most engaging lecturer and professor I've ever had personally. And she practically lives in the Learning Center now because she cares so deeply about her students that she is there for them. Like, it seems like 24-7, but I know it's not. <laughs> um, she's always an email away, though. So, she asked us to do some interpretive dance tonight, so I just want to... Um, no, just kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not going to sing a song. Without any further ado, here is Dr. B. Well then, I'm not entirely sure that I can follow that up, and I should try. Good evening, everyone, friends, scholars, scientists. I am excited to be here. Um, so, there we were in the lunchroom. I was innocently eating leftovers from the night before, having a nonchalant conversation with Rance, being like, you know what? I really wish someone would tell our students. And here we are. So let's just get to it, shall we? Um, some of you are former slash current students of mine, and you're still here listening to me talk some more, which is charming and confusing to me, thank you. Some of you have, yeah, shout out, Myra. Um, some of you have never had me before, so this is kind of what some of my classes look like. I like to upfront um, set expectations, right? I like you to know like what you're getting into, what is this gonna look like, what are we doing and what are we not doing here, okay? So in terms of setting expectations, what is this not? What are we not going to do with this talk? Um, this is not one of those clickbaity things where it's like simple tricks to fix your life, to get you the STEM career that you want and to tell you out now. This is not going to be that because I don't know how you should do that. So if you're looking for that, I very sincerely apologize. Emergency exits are there, there, and there. Uh, <laughs> you like. This is also not a handy dandy to-do list where if you complete all of these things in order and spin three times under a full moon, you will definitely get what you want again. I, none of us here have the power to do that, and hopefully if you've uh, been attending enough STEM talks where people tell you what their path looks like, you're starting to get the sense that there is no one way to do this. Um, what this is going to be is me giving you an idea of what has gotten me to be standing here um, with some snarky anecdotes thrown in and some really bad sci-fi references, because that's just how it works. So that's what you are getting yourself into, okay? Um, I want to make a note about how people talk about their paths to careers, um, or at least how this went when I was a student. Because the way that this was always pitched to me, and maybe the technology has improved since I was much younger, um, but the way that this was always pitched back in my day, was that the career path looked very much like a direct path from A to B if you were doing it correctly, right? The folks who gave, is, can you hear me okay? I don't know what the direction I do, I, yeah? I don't know what this means. Oh, that was an okay, okay. I'm like, you want me to send the waitress to you? We don't have one of those. Okay, great, good talk. Okay, so, right, like, you make a decision, you decide what you want to be when you grow up, and then you just go there in this very direct fashion. 
And I don't know if this has been your experience. I imagine it hasn't been your experience in these talks necessarily, but my experience was very much so that the people that I would hear from in these manner of talks were the people who did it this way. And the people who were held up as examples of this is how you go about adulting were the people who very much did it this way. And so my idea of how it was supposed to look looked very much this way. Um, and I imagine that you've probably heard more and more that it often looks a lot more like this, right? The scenic route, the, you know, you start that way and then other stuff comes up and you might backtrack and you stop and you find a penny and oh look, there's something over there and oh, I didn't expect that to happen. And you do actually eventually make it to your end point. Here's what my path actually looked like, and here's one that I don't really hear talked about that much. <laughs> right? And again, please, I'm not saying it went down and that things got bad. What I'm saying is that I ended up doing something that I never even considered. I ended up somewhere that was not even on my radar. And I feel like that's an important thing to acknowledge because that sort of thing happens too. And I feel like the more examples you have of people do this too, the more, I feel like it's important to normalize stuff. There's a whole bunch of different ways to go about this. And the people who do it this way, bless their hearts, are actually statistical outliers. So even though these are the folks who get the TED Talks and write the books, um, statistically speaking, the vast majority of us aren't going to do it this way. And unfortunately, because we hear from them a lot, when we don't do it this way, we feel like we're doing it incorrectly. I hear this from my students on the regular. So I feel like one of the most important things I can tell you is, here's what mine looked like, and I'm doing pretty okay. So take that for what you will. All right. So. What does that look like in specifics? A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, called New Jersey. <laughs> so, for reference, I realize that you may have always been in California your entire life. That makes sense to me. This is a wonderful place. I moved here, I never left. That was almost 20 years ago, right? So, we are Mia. I come from Mia. That is a little spot called Pompton Lakes, New Jersey. It has seasons besides warm and rain, and warm rain. There's snow. It, it's a thing, right? That's where I was born and raised. And again, I feel like the model for a lot of, here's what my path was like, is for a lot of folks, they are able to identify the exact moment in fetal development where they're like, Oh uh, yes, I want to be an astronaut. That is what the rest of my life is going to be. Or, I am going to take the art world by storm. Or, no, 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 I am going to be a doctor. Um, in case it was not already clear, I am not that guy. Right? So, it's... And again, I feel like especially with even with science, when I'm reading a lot of bios of people in my field and colleagues, they're like, oh yeah, when I was three, I was doing experiments and ba 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 ba. And I'm like, when I was three, I wanted to be a ballerina because the costume was sweet. Right? I feel like my career development process was pretty developmentally appropriate. Pretty early on, I decided what I wanted to be when I was growing up based on how cool the uniform was. I was like, tattoo, or tattoos, well, I got those two. Tutus, <laughs> that was later, right? But like, tutus and sequins, hell yes, sign me up, totally. Did I ever take a ballet class in my life? No, totally not the point. I then wanted to be a warrior princess, because I'm like, swords? Yes, I will take two. Then after that I was like, firefighter? Yes, I want to squirt a really big hose, let's do this, right? Like, so, Again, I'm being glib, but my point is, yeah, there are some folks who know really, really early on and follow this very direct path, and then there's the rest of the most of us. And that's totally, totally normal. Um, there is one thing that I want to talk about, right? Um, 
And I feel like it's something, it's stuff that, especially um, with faculty, it's important for us to do. And that's a, um, I think it's really important for me to check my privilege. Um, hello, I'm a white person. Um, I am also from an upper middle class background. Um, I am financially privileged. I'm educationally privileged. I went directly from high school to college. Um, my parents helped me pay for college. Um, all of these things have directly impacted my path. And so to not acknowledge that completely misses a whole part of my story. And so talking about how did I get from there to here without actually being like, hey, let's stop and, stop and talk about the fact that my race completely puts me in at, an, at an advantage over people who are not my race. Let's talk about the fact that I didn't have to worry about whether I was going to be able to afford things, right? Let's talk about the fact that I started talking about going to college when I was 10 years old and nobody questioned me. I was never in my entire life not going to college. That in my mind, in my parents' minds, in the minds of everyone around me. And that's not the case for everyone. And that makes for a completely different path than someone who starts thinking about going to college when they're 17 and doesn't have financial resources already put aside for that. So we can talk all we want about how hard I've worked and what my, how smart I am and all of that stuff, but this, right? Like the fact that like I started talking about my educational path in a really serious way before I was even in middle school and people took me seriously and encouraged me, that is an amount of, that is hugely privileged and makes a huge difference. And again, for people who did not have that, it, yeah, their path is gonna look really different. That makes a lot of sense, right? So something to think about. And yeah, also, really questionable hairstyles about it. I was in New Jersey, it was the 80s. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Mistakes were made. Okay, so this was me starting to talk about going to college when I was in fifth grade. It was New Jersey, smart people went to Princeton. I started talking about doing that too. Um, it ended up not being where I went to college, but like, that's when my parents and I started talking about what my future career path was going to look like. I still had no idea what I was going to study or what I wanted to be when I grew up, but I was very clear that I was on this educational path of like, when I finish high school, I am going to go to college somewhere, I am going to get a degree in something that smart people get a degree in. Um, I very often said I wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer because that's what smart people did. I had like this vague fifth grader idea that that's what you said. Um, but I couldn't tell you why. Um, so then I got into high school, and when I was in like my freshman and sophomore year of high school, um, two really major things happened. Um, one major thing that happened was cancer. Um, my dad was diagnosed with colon cancer when I was at the beginning of my freshman year of high school. Um, and I don't know how many of you have experience with like major big deal diseases. I hope none of you, and I bet that's not the case. Um, there are lots of ways that folks react when they find out that someone close to them is really, really sick with a disease. Um, I went in the direction of, I will research the heck out of this because I want to understand it and I want to understand what's happening. And so I think one of the ways that I kind of got interested in science was as a coping mechanism. Um, I was trying to understand, honestly, what was killing my dad and what ultimately did. Sorry, that was a downer, but that's really the truth. Um, the happier side of that was I took AP Biology, and AP Biology blew my freaking mind. Woo! Yeah, yeah, right? Like, I went into this class, I'm like, oh, there's no way I'm gonna do well in this class. I don't even know what I'm doing here. I'm so gonna flunk this class. I kicked the crap out of that class. 
And I had so much fun. Have you ever taken that class where you're like, I'm so excited to be here, but I'm also so terrified to be here. And also, I don't know why this stuff makes sense, but whoa, dude, that was AP bio for me. And I'm like, I just want to do this all the time now. I think I'm a nerd. I don't understand the feelings I'm having about biology. Yeah, I know, right? So that happened, right? So at this point, I'm like a junior in high school and visions of science are dancing in my head. So I'm already in the, clearly I'm going to college, but I'm like, ugh. Now I'm going to college and I'm going to study science and I'm going to cure cancer, thank you very much. Don't mind if I do. Spoiler alert, I didn't cure cancer. <laughs> Bummer. But like, that's kind of like where I was going with this, right? So now our journey takes us to Boston. Um, so I moved even further away from home. Uh, so I went north to Boston. I went to Boston College, um, which looks like this. There are many Gothic towers and architecture and things of that nature. It's very pretty. They have seasons there too. Um, and I majored in biology, but while I was there, I started doing research. Um, there is a really large medical center called Longwood, um, where Harvard Medical School is, where Boston Children's Hospital is, where Beth Israel Deaconess uh, is, where the Dana-Farber Cancer Center is. Um, and I managed to find a spot in a research lab there um, that, again, I worked there without getting paid, which I had the privilege to do. Not everybody can do that, so something to, to check. Um, but I started doing research in a cancer lab, um, and I got my name on a paper. Yeah, which, you know, sweet. Um, but all of this time I was like, oh no, the, the end point for this is medical school. I'm going to medical school. I'm going to become a doctor and cure cancer. And as I'm doing this, I'm doing really well in my biology classes. And I'm noticing that the idea of going to medical school does not make me happy at all. But I'm like, no, but that's what I'm supposed to do. Smart people who are biology majors are pre-meds and they go to medical school. That is what you do. That's the answer. Um, and I'm like, I don't really get along with any of the people who are pre-meds. I'm going to go to school with them some more. This seems like a bad plan. I'm very unhappy studying for the MCATs. This seems like a bad plan. And so in one very stressful week, I threw out all of my MCAT books and I'm like, I am going to graduate school. That'll be easier. That was adorable. Um, <laughs> but I did, I decided to go to graduate school in, instead of medical school, which, yeah, all the, <laughs> Carol Rhodes is laughing at me. She also went to graduate school for biology. You know, it seemed like a, a much simpler option at the time. People, you know, I also decided to get a perm. Mistakes were made, right? So I realized that medical school was not what was going to make me happy, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to research the hell out of cancer and cure it that way. I see what I'm going to do here. So this is where, like, A is birth, B is medical school, right? And so the path was, like, aimed firmly at medical school, and then I'm like, mm, maybe not. So I start to deviate. So that's when I started applying to graduate schools, right? I'd been working in a lab. I was like, I like this research thing. I can go to grad school. I can get a PhD. I won't go into as much debt as I will in medical school. That all sounds like a pretty good plan to me. So I moved to San Francisco and I went to UCSF. Um, and I, yeah, there's Parnassus. And I got attached to a lab bench for like six years. And so I ended up researching bone biology for six years. I researched how bones form. I researched how bones repair themselves when you break them. Um, I specifically looked at this one, the role of this one particular gene called MMP13 in bone formation and in bone repair. Um, so that was my graduate work. It was looking at a whole lot of mouse bones for, a real, for six years of my life. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. So like at this point on our timeline, we're about 
meow, right? So like I have finished my post, my post back education, I finished graduate school, so I'm like at about where I would be if I had gone to medical school, I just went a different path. Here's the catch. I'm like, sweet, I graduated. That's no small thing. Like finishing your PhD, finishing your dissertation, that's huge. But then I was like, well, well now what do I do? Because the thing is, when you do a research degree, the expectation is that you're then going to stay attached to a lab bench. You're going to do what's called postdoctoral research. You finish your doctoral degree, and then you keep on doing more research as a postdoctoral researcher, or you go into industry. I was super duper clear that those were not the things that I wanted to do. What I wasn't so clear on was what I actually did want to do. Like many humans, and this might sound familiar to you if you are a real life human, I am way better at crossing things off my list than I am at adding, well, no, I'm good at adding things to it, but in terms of selecting, crossing things off is a way, way easier thing to do, right? And so I had crossed off a whole bunch of things very firmly, but in terms of being like, okay, what is this thing, now that I have this, these letters after my name and people could ostensibly call me doctor, what do, besides just making people at the grocery store call me doctor, could <laughs> Miss or Mrs. Doctor actually. Um, like what, what do I actually wanna do with this if it's not the automatic thing that people expect you to do? And that was the bit that was really challenging. Um, I had a really hard time after graduate school figuring out what the heck I wanted to do. Um, and what ended up happening was I tripped and fell on a biology class that needed a teacher. Um, I was living in San Francisco at the time. Um, I happened to be on a mailing list. Uh, the UCSF Career Center had a mailing list that I was on. And there was uh, a community college in Oakland that had a physiology class where the uh, professor uh, that was supposed to be teaching the physiology class um, wasn't had to cancel at the last minute, like right before the semester started, and they needed somebody to teach their physiology class. And I was the first person who responded. And they were like, you have a PhD from UCSF. They, you didn't actually, they didn't actually say this, but I, what I imagined they said was, you have a PhD from UCSF, I'll take it, right? And so that's how I ended up teaching my first community college class. It was a, and I completely misunderstood what I was going to be doing. I misread the email. So what I thought, yeah, my physiology students are gonna love this one. So what I thought I was signing up for was, I thought that it was just a lab class where I just had to sit there in the lab and make sure that the students didn't light themselves on fire. What I didn't know that it was that it was a lecture and lab class and I actually had to teach lecture. I didn't find that out until after I had volunteered for it, and I was like, oh my heavens and stars. And at that point, I couldn't back out. And I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, so that's how I got my first class. And it ended up being a really wonderful experience because, I, so I taught the Tuesday, Thursday night section of physiology. Um, there was another professor who was young, but she was full-time. She was a couple years older than me. She was, had more experience than me. Um, she taught the daytime class on Monday and Wednesday. And so I would go to her class on Monday, and I would watch what she did. And then I would teach that class on Tuesday night. And then I'd go to her class on Wednesday and watch what she did. And I'd teach that class on Thursday night. And then we'd do the same thing next week. I'd go to her class on Monday and then watch what she did. And I teach that class on Tuesday. You see what I did there, right? By the third week, I didn't have to go to her class anymore because I'm like, I got this. I didn't have it, but I had it enough, right? And that's how I got through teaching my first class. Um, I still, this was 10 years ago. I still teach physiology. The way that I teach physiology looks different from that. Um, I like to think the jokes are better. I like to think the slides are better. Ray just shook his head, I'm gonna ignore that. Um, that's fine. You weren't there, Ray, you don't know my life. Um, <laughs> right? But it works. 
And it was interesting because I kind of saw it as a, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just sort of biding my time. I need to, quite honestly, like I need to pay my rent. So I took this job. And what was interesting was um, another person in the department happened to be like the way the science rooms were set up. There were two science classrooms right next to each other with a prep room in between them, like the lab prep rooms. And one of the older seasoned veteran professors in the department happened to be sitting in the prep room um, during one of my classes and had left the door open and basically eavesdropped on my class and I didn't know he was in there. And he came to me after class and let me know that like he was really impressed with how I was doing and how I was engaging the students and I was like, sorry, what? Huh? Like, this is, this is not a thing that, like, apparently I was decent at it. And I was like, huh, okay, cool. And then I just went back to what I was doing. And like, it didn't even occur to me to think about that as maybe I want to do this as a career. It didn't occur to me for like another year that like, maybe I want to do this as a career. Um, and at that point, when I finally decided it was a career that I wanted, that's when I applied for my job here. And so that's how I ended up with, huh, didn't see that one coming. Yeah, okay. So, let's talk about my work, right? Like, you've all taken, like, you're all STEM students, you know what it looks like to take a class here, right? Like, you come in, the teacher teaches you stuff, but you also probably take classes from professors who are trying to figure out better ways to do this, right? They are trying to figure out, um, right, because like, it's my job to be excited. Obviously, if I weren't stoked about pretty much everything I was teaching most of the time, I wouldn't be doing this job. And so the challenge isn't me being excited about what I'm doing and what I'm teaching. The challenge is how do I get, like, this is my research question as far as I'm concerned, right? What will engage a student who isn't as excited to be learning whatever it is I'm teaching that day as I am to be teaching it? Because my baseline assumption when I walk into a classroom is I'm stoked as hell to be teaching whatever I'm teaching that day. Even if it's something where I'm like, meh, plant cells, not so excited. Sorry if you love plant cells. I just, killed, I just killed Carol's soul. That's why you teach that class, Carol, and I don't. Yeah, it's good, it's good. You, I stay in my lane, right? Yeah, I'll be in the anatomy lab, it's fine, it's fine, right? But like, I could still get, but I could still get excited about plants. I screamed about a paramecium the other day, is that a plant? I did that out of the YouTube video. I don't actually, I don't remember. Okay. So anyway, that's not the challenge. The challenge is the student who isn't excited to be there, right? Isn't excited to be there because this is just a class they're taking to complete their GE pattern. Isn't excited to be there because they had to get on the bus at four in the morning to public transit here for my 8 a.m. class. Isn't excited to be here because they were up all night with their kid who's really, really sick. And so it's hard for them to be excited about anything because they didn't get any sleep last night. Really not excited to be here because they've had really crappy experiences in science classes before and that experience is totally getting in the way of them feeling comfortable in my class almost no matter what I do, right? Or students who are just like, I don't really like this class, right? Which is fair and they still have to be there, right? So how do I, get a student to engage um, in something that I'm really, really excited about that they're either not excited about or there's something getting in the way of them engaging with. That's what my work, so like, I imagine that like a lot of the STEM speakers who come in are talking to you about their research on a scientific question or an, in a research lab. This is my research. This is what I'm doing, okay? So, let's try it. I would like you to think of a science topic that you are so very excited about. And I'm using science in the broadest, it can be, I mean, STEM, right? Maybe it's in your engineering class, maybe it's in your math class, maybe it's in, like, if you were to walk into your favorite class ever 
and find out that you were going to be covering that topic that day, it would be like you were on an episode of Oprah's Favorite Things and you were going to get the car. You get to talk about this and you get to talk about this and everybody, you know what I'm talking about? That thing that you're super duper stoked about, you could talk about it all day. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. I would like you to turn to the person next to you, in front of you, behind you, and I would like you to tell each other what that thing is. Ready? Go. back is, um, yeah, Becky's a nose. I've installed a cowbell in all of my classrooms, so the way that I bring your attention back is with more cowbell. Yeah, yeah, so like those of you who teach in the classrooms, yeah, you, you know, um, the reason that there's a cowbell in all those classrooms is because I teach there, and you always need more, this is the semester where we need more cowbell, I've decided that. All right, so, who wants to tell me a thing? What was, what was your thing that you're 100% stoked about? The prize is erasers shaped like tiny, adorable food. <laughs> Who else? Andy. Dark matter. Ooh, dark matter. You have to talk. What else? So we have dark matter and immunology. What else? Yes. Uh, Cambo, Amazonian frog medicine. <gasps> Amazonian frog medicine. I don't even know what that is. You get a piece of cake. What else? Don't all jump at once. Jay. So I need to those equations in algebra. I love algebra. My mom's a math teacher. I love algebra. Person in the house whose name I don't know. Robotics. Again, please. Robotics. Robotics. You get ice cream cone. Kevin Asher. Right on. Heyo. She was a softball player. Who could have seen that one coming? What else? Oh, man. Come on. Yes, person. Derivatives and the quotient rule. Ooh, derivatives. Yeah. Hang on. I want to take this aerodynamic for you. <laughs> Yeah, popsicle, my friend. Oh, thank you. Oh, nice. Yes. Uh, triple integrals. Triple integrals. Oh, I feel like I feel like we just got into a math arms race here, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. Um, French fries coming your way. Anybody else? Also, you just made Ray really happy. Stacy Gorman. mechanisms, which is something she learned in my class. <laughs> That's how you break a teacher's heart in the best way ever. You get a strawberry shortcake. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Rebecca. <gasps> okay, now they're just messing with me. So, <laughs> you get an ice cream cone. Rebecca just said calcium induced calcium release, which is a lie because she hates calcium induced calcium release. She, <laughs> she, it annoy, she likes it and it annoys the heck out of her. I'm sorry, I misrepresented that. Anybody else want to, and we can talk, sorry, these are students who had me last semester and there was an entire thing in the learning center and it was just Rebecca having feelings about calcium induced calcium release. And you know what, she, she's not wrong. She's not wrong, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so now everybody's got that thing in your head. Think about how you would explain that thing to someone who knows nothing about it. Very often when I, I know, right? Somebody who doesn't know anything about it. Very often my metric for this is like five-year-old. Or if you have a housemate who isn't taking your, the same classes as you. Or if your bae isn't taking the same classes as you. Maybe you already do this with or without their consent. I hope with their consent. Consent is important. That's another talk, right? Okay. 
Now think about how you would do this, how you would explain it to someone who knows nothing about it and who doesn't share your enthusiasm for the topic. What was your... Shut you off? Right. This is what we're doing. This is my, this is my research. <laughs> how do we do this? What does this look like? Right? Sometimes it is throw out a question and get people to talk to each other and share ideas. That was dirty teacher trick number 305. Sometimes it's get people to yell things out and throw tiny prizes at their head. Dirty teacher trick number 202. Right? But this is, yeah, this is the stuff. Um, so if you see teachers around you trying new things and maybe them working and maybe them not, it may very well, and a bunch of them are sitting in the audience, it may very well be them making an attempt at this. Um, so I think with that, question? Leave time for questions? 15 minutes? Okay. That's what I've got. Questions? Is it Lolly? Did you ever, um, will, they, will they ever bring back the women's health class that you spoke about a couple of years back when I had a teacher that yeah. you used to teach? But so Satlali is asking about Health Science 116, Women's Health Issues, which is a class that is in the catalog, but we rarely offer. And the issue, the, the challenge, um, is that when we do offer it, people don't sign up for it. So we have tried to run that class, I think, six times, and it's run twice. Um, and a lot of times it gets canceled because like 10 people will sign up for it. So when I talk to students one-on-one -on -one about it, they get really, really excited about it, and there seems to be a lot of demand about it. And I generally like hustle like, whoa, and I table, and I you know, spread the good news about it, and then nobody signs up for it. So the reason that we don't offer it is because there have been so many times that we've tried to offer it, and then we end up canceling it. And as you know, when you cancel a class, then you leave students scrambling to make up those units and trying to find another class and another, that fits in their schedule. And yeah, so I think it is, one of my favorite, all of my classes are my babies, but like that one especially I feel really strongly about and I wish we could teach it more often, but the, the anecdotal information we have about demand and what we actually see when people sign up don't agree. How many students do you need to keep it open? It's, 20, it's like the 20 person rule, and we usually get around 10. And we've been allowed to run it with fewer than 20 a couple of times, but we can't do that over and over again. No prereqs. Transferable to CSU and UC. Area E1. Three units. But yeah, like, if the people want it, we would offer it. But again, we, we get word that people want it, and then we don't actually see the enrollment numbers. So we're bound by what people actually want, or what people actually show up, like show up for in enrollment. So the question is, for someone who's, uh, and the example is someone who's thinking of going to nursing school, but also thinking of going to medical school and trying to make that decision, and the advice that they've been given is to go to medical school, because if they um, go to nursing school, they might have regrets about not going to medical school, and then ultimately the question is whether I have regrets about not having gone to medical school. Um, I think... I think I'm definitely, like, I don't think you said regrets, you said you wonder what if. I think I definitely am curious. Um, I think the decision that I made in the moment was totally the right decision for then me. I think then me needed to not go to medical school. 
Um, going to medical school is something that pops into my head every couple of years, and I'm like, do I or don't I want to do that to myself right now? Hmm. Um, because I think the other thing is, right, and I think this is, this. I didn't have a chance to talk about this, or I didn't put this in, um, but there's this, I, st I feel like there's still this old school idea that you're gonna go to school, you're gonna get a degree, you're gonna have a job, and then you're gonna work that job for the rest of your life. And that's not how the job, the world works anymore, right? Realistically speaking, and I'm saying this as like a professor with tenure, so I'm like, I'm in that job that you're supposed to keep forever. Um, but realistically speaking, just because you go to and get a degree and then get a job, it doesn't mean that that's the thing you're locked in forever and you can't ever retrain and do another thing, right? And again, I say that realizing that like, that assumes that you have time, money, the, you know, the space in life to do it. But I would encourage you to, or at least I know that I'm trying to do this as well, remember that just because you are in a career or on a career path doesn't mean that following that locks you into it, right? So if, yeah, so I mean, I'm glad that I followed the path that I followed because I think at the time, it was what I needed, was what was right for me, and I like where it's led me to. And I also am very aware of the fact that I might end up, like, my assumption is not that point C is the end. My assumption is that point C is where I am right now. And I don't know, like, full confession, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I'm still trying to figure that out. And I'm saying that as a professor with tenure. I just haven't figured out what the next step is yet. So I don't know, I, every once in a while I think about going to medical school, nursing school, PA school, mortuary science college. Um, sometimes I wanna go back and major in math because that sounds really fun. Yeah. So all of this long-windedness to say, you can make a choice now and it doesn't mean that you don't get to make a different choice later. And that would be outstandingly, again, outstandingly normal of you. Any, any, anybody else? D does this mean I nailed it? Why thank you, Dr. V, for willing to uh, participate in our speaker series. And I might have you back again. <laughs> but as a little token of gratitude from the uh, STEM Center, we got you uh, a miniature coffee mug. Aww. And then with inside the miniature coffee mug is a little lanyard for your keys. And a notepad, in case you need that one. And of course, a little black binder. For I love all the supplies. <laughs> all right. Okay, so real quick, um, if you want to get your uh, attendance credit, we, we will be zapping your, your ID cards. And also, there's extra food. Please take it because we don't give food away. We don't throw it away. Well, we give food away, but we don't throw it away. So please take as many little hamburgers as you want and little, other little stuff. Take all that you can take.